We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 17. Uh, last week, we looked at the introduction. We covered a bunch of things, how the, the church in, uh, came to Corinth, and we looked at Paul's second, second missionary journey out of Acts 18. Uh, we looked at kind of the culture and geography of Corinth. Remember the the word Corinth was kind of a Corinthians was kind of a, a slur to to kind of look down upon the Corinthians. Uh, seaport town uh, had a had uh, various uh, temples devoted to to sexual relations uh, there. Richard, can you close that door for me, please? Thank you. Uh, break down the. In looking at the book, chapters 1 through 6, it's a clear breakdown. Chapters 1 through 6 is um, things that Paul found out about it. We'll talk about that this morning. And then chapter 7 and following is now concerning the things that you wrote. And the five major problems, division, sex, food, gathering, and resurrection. And we talked about last week how Paul Paul's answer to all these was to define the problem and then... Uh, show how the message of the gospel can take care of that particular problem. There was a question uh, from last week after class, and I'm bringing this up because a lot of times people ask me questions privately, and, and some of them are worthy to be mentioned, and I, and I think, well, probably other people want to know about that. Uh, Sosothenes and Crispus were called ruler of the synagogues. Uh, a ruler of the synagogue was the man chosen to care for the physical arrangements of the synagogue services. The president of the synagogue would be the equivalent designation today. It's the, uh, the ruler of the synagogue at that particular time was the, the person who <coughs> pardon me, took care of, of getting everything ready, uh, setting up the, the instruments and setting up the, the pots and uh, all the things uh, particularly to get ready. And so it would have been somebody of, of noteworthy, both noteworthy and trustworthy um, uh, abilities. All right. So we dipped our toes a little bit in the text last week. Uh, we're going to go back and we're not going to cover it all again in <clears throat> the first uh, few verses, but we are going to um, read it just to kind of get the context. So chapter 1, verse 1, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosothenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you, but that you be not in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did I baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. We're looking at this, we go back to verse 5, and, and, and again, we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, Brother Marty brought up a good, uh, good point, was these people had the Holy Spirit with them. They had the active working. Uh, they, they spoke in tongues. And all those things uh, that we think about, 
uh, to help the congregation along, and they still have a lot of problems. In fact, he says they've been given everything. They were given everything. They were given spiritual gifts. They were given healing. They were given great speakers, the Apostle Paul. All the things that we think uh, today, uh, in fact, some people still think today that that's what, that's what you need to, to make a prosperous congregation. And, that's, and, and Paul says none of that was held back from, from these folks at Corinth. Verse 7, so that you're not lacking any gift. Uh, they have everything, everything they need to be able to stand before them. Oh, my goodness. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, everything that they need to do before, be able to stand before them on, uh, before God on judgment day. That was me. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, and, and that'll become more uh, evident once we get to chapter 12 uh, through 14 where we see those spiritual gifts. And what we, what we determine, and I'll just give you a preview when we get to chapters 12 through, through 14, that above all, love is more important than all that stuff. No matter what you do, love is still important. It's, it's important. And we're going to talk about that some more today. Verse 8. He said, who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowship is that joint participation with Christ in all spiritual matters, uh, in his feelings, in his views, his trials and his suffering, his resurrection to the new life, his, his reward to in, eternal glory. In fact, the word Christ appears more often in this book than in any others. And he appears nine times in these first nine verses. And, and you have to think that it was Paul's intent to stress that name often in effort to diminish their, their emphasis on other names. Verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brother. And that's the idea that that appeal is, is the same thing as I beseech or I beg, I urge. I, I'm, I, I, I'm pleading with you. I'm trying to get you to understand this. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you and that you may be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, that, that's not an odd concept to Christians. And we're going to talk about that in depth here in just a moment. That we all speak the same thing happens when we respect the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit has spoken about the matter. We all speak the same thing when we look at God's Word unabashed from, from the world around us. We don't bring our own pride and prejudices into it. And we let the Word of God talk to us, and then we do what it says. When we go beyond what the Bible says, or we add into it, we put any extra stuff in there, that's where we usually have the problems. No, no I'm sorry. I shouldn't have used the word usually. That's where we have the problems. Pride and putting our own stuff in there will get us into trouble. Christians must allow no divisions that occur through human wisdom when we forego the clear teaching of God's Word. How many times does God have to show us in, in, his, in his Word that human wisdom doesn't work as opposed to God's wisdom? God's doing it for a reason. And, and I think about Uzzah grabbing hold of that cart the, the Ark of the Covenant, and, and hold it back. Well, if you go back and read that, you know, I, I've, told, I've said this many times before. When I was a kid, I used to think that was a horrible story. All he was trying to do was help. A, it shouldn't have been on a cart in the first place. And if it hadn't have been on the cart, it wouldn't have tumbled over. And if it wouldn't have tumbled over, Uzzah wouldn't have put his hand up, and he wouldn't have died. And then when you look, and then when you really peel it all back, David was the one that had the problem because David was like, oops, I'm the one that messed up. Why did he mess up? Because he was the leader. So when we put, but again, that was human wisdom that said, ah, I got a better way. We're always trying to help God out. You ever notice that? When folks try to help God out, that usually doesn't work out very well for them. Again, I use that word usually. I shouldn't I should need to quit using that word, Rob. I'm going to wake y'all up this morning. Y'all go, okay. Yeah. All right, verse, 
Verse 10. So unity is not unity just for the sake of unity. When I'm talking about unity here, I'm not talking about unity. Let's just all be unified just for the sake of unity. There are people, there is, there is one particular uh, denomination that is uh, unity. It's a unity church. And they believe whatever you want to believe. Whatever you want to believe. That, that's their whole thing. They're Unitarians. They're you, just whatever you want to believe. Just don't, just don't, whatever. That's the way it is. Unity is not uniformity. I was in the, the Marine Corps for 24 years. I can tell you, just because you put on a uniform and everybody has the same uniform, that didn't mean we all thought alike. Okay? Unity is not uniformity. We don't have to, and again, here we go, because sometimes we think to ourselves, man, if, 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 if we could just lay down a bunch of laws and rules and, and we had codes and bylaws, I mean, that works so well for us at the union plant, right, John? That works so well. All, this, all problems are solved by codes and rules and bylaws. And we got, no, John will tell you that's not always the good. There's problems with that. If we just do it God's way, then we don't have a problem. Unity is also not group think. Unity is not group think. Can I, can we have, uh, can we have uh, differences about God's word? We can, we can, uh, we, we can look and we can and study the scripture. And that's, that's what we should do. The unity demanded by Jesus requires that we all have the same mind, we all have the same purpose, and we all have the same values, and that we have the same judgment, the opinion. The judgment comes from where? God's Word. God's Word. The first is achieved when the Scripture is clearly taught. <clears throat> Brother July and I were talking about this. Pardon me. Brother July and I were talking about this the other night. And it is amazing that you can read through some of these commentaries, and these commentaries are so great and so wonderful about certain things, and they have absolute blinders on in certain areas. And you think, how can somebody be so intelligent and so smart in certain things and just be blinded? And they're blinded by the theology that they bring into it. And I pray, God, that I don't do that with, with God's Word. I pray, God, that I open up God's Word and I read it for what it says and I do what He says. The second part of that will prevail when the members willingly submit to God's Word and the elders who rule over the local church. When, when, when we submit to God's Word, when we submit to God's Word, then we follow and do what he says. There's a song that, that I, I brought up a couple of times before, but it was, it was, it was a song by uh, Roger Miller, and it said, and it's a song about marriage relationships. And the song goes, it's my belief that pride is the chief, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I may have to sing it. <laughs> it's my belief that pride is the chief in the number of us. Uh, oh, uh, pride is the chief uh, decline. Thank you, dear. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. You know the song. Uh, it's my belief that pride is the chief uh, decline in the number of husbands and wives. And, and the point of the song is that w w what affects most husband and wife relationships is pride. You know, I think the toilet paper ought to go this way. She thinks it ought to go that way. And we're going to have a fight and argument about which way the toilet paper goes. And if you ain't been married for about 10, 15 years, you think that's a dumb fight. But you, when you get, you know, I want to win one every now and then, you know, so... But pride, and in and, 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 and biblical relationships, it's the same way. In congregational relationships, it's the same way. Pride becomes a factor. Okay. 
Now, Paul says the same thing in Philippians, Philippians 2, 2. Complete my joy by, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. This isn't, this isn't something novel he's presenting here in Corinth. He, he says the same thing in Philippians. Be of the same mind, be of the same love. Uh, Philippians 3.15, let those of, of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. We, we, we got to be of the same mind. We got to be pushing toward the same direction. We need to make sure that our, our mission is still the same. Well, there we go. Okay. All right, verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Now, the who of Chloe is, is really irrelevant. Uh, the, I don't, we're not really sure who Chloe is, but she was somebody. Um, anyway, but the Corinthians knew who Paul was making the reference to. And, and it's interesting to me, from the Holy Spirit vantage point, that the first problem Paul addresses is not the sexual immorality or the problem with the resurrection or the problem with the Lord's Supper, but the first problem he deals with is people dividing up and quarreling. Now, the reason I say that is, is, is that's interesting to me is because that... You, I'm sure you've been in situations where things are just going crazy. Well, this thing is, man, this messed it up over here. No, whew, this thing is, you know, they have a thing in ER, Brother July, where you, you prioritize stuff, right? You got to, you know, they taught us uh, start the breeding, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, treat for shock. You know, there's a certain order of things. I don't even know if I get that right. Did I get it right? I don't know. Anyway, you do one of those. Something's, something's first, okay? Because there's priorities in things. You got to get some stuff right. You got to get priorities right. And if you don't, because if you, if you don't fix the first problem, then problem two, I, who cares about treat for shock if the guy ain't breathing, right? Nobody cares if he's in shock if the guy's not breathing. He's got to breathe at some point. And so you gotta, you got to do it in priority. So Paul is, is the, and the Holy Spirit is looking at this in the priority of fix the first problem first, the quarreling and the dividing. And if we get that problem right, then the, fixing these other problems will be a whole lot easier as we go along. So verse 12, and I love when Paul does this, what I mean is, I'm just going to tell you what I mean. <laughs> There's a whole lot of times when Paul doesn't, you don't have to figure, what is Paul trying to say here? No, nope, he tells you. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Paul, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Paul doesn't call out the ringleaders, but he does say that each one of you, all of them have been compliant. All of them. He, 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 doesn't come, he doesn't call out uh, Rob, you know, I'm going to call out Rob. No, no, he calls out everybody, all of you. Because if you got in one of these groups, you've been compliant. You're part of the problem. You're part of the issue. So it was common in Greek culture, by the way, just to identify who you belong to. It, it's sort of like saying, I, well, I listen to MSNBC, or I listen to Fox News, or I listen to Ben Shapiro, or I listen to... Rachel Maddow, you know, one of those, you know. So that was common. And again, we, what we see is, we see that culture bleeding over to the church and coming over to the church. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 6, he said, I have applied all these things to myself and apostles for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of, of one against another. I'm putting, now, he said, I'm going to put myself and Apollos in these things because I want you to understand where, where we're coming from. Now, 
we talked about this group before, four groups that will, will permeate Paul's thought even as we go through the letter. Again, and, and you can understand why. You can understand why from the Jewish perspective, Peter or Cephas, right, would, would, would be lifted up. You know, uh, Peter's, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, uh, the, the keys to the kingdom. He was right there, you know, with Jesus all along the way. He's, Peter has a lot of things going for him. What about the Apollos? Apollos was, again, uh, the great charismatic speaker, eloquent, uh, valued, uh, uh, following the Greek culture that valued speech and intellectual thought. Paul, of course, was the original preacher, the, the missionary work that, that laid the foundation. And, and then you had the only crass crowd that, that was, again, uh, hints of Gnosticism and, and, and maybe misguided at best trying to, trying to say, we're only going to do what Christ says. We're only going to do what Jesus says. Not you, Johnny, come lately's. Okay. And, and certainly we can see each one of these possess special qualities that would be desirable in a religious leader. And, and what I mean to point out by this is that, look, we got to be a little nice to the Corinthians <clears throat> because, because we never, never, never pick our favorite. I'm sorry, my tongue was way far in my cheek when I said that. Okay, Y'all are looking at me really, y'all need to smile or show me something this way. Okay, okay. All right. We always, we do, we pick favorites. We pick favorites. One of the, by the way, one of the reasons I love the song leaders, uh, we, the variety of song leaders that we have, because if you don't like our song leader, wait a month, we'll get another one. Somebody else will be up there leading. Well, I don't like the way Tyler leads. I like the way Cody leads. Okay, wait, wait a month. Tyler be gone. Well, I like the way Brother Todd leads. Well, let, let uh, yeah. wait a month. Somebody else will be up there. I like the way Dana leads. Well, okay, wait a month. Somebody will be, uh, you know. You don't have to get through four weeks of it. It's no big deal. Why? Because Peter certainly... You could appreciate his aggressiveness. Why would, why would people follow behind Peter? Because certainly you could appreciate his aggressiveness, his defending the gospel. You know, Peter was out there. He was always there. Uh, the, uh, Apollos was an Alexandrian Jew. Philo of Alexandria, uh, where Apollos was from, had combined Plato and, and Moses together. So he, did, he had, he, uh, Philo of Alexandria had combined uh, the great logic of, of, of Plato and that thinking along with Moses and kind of melded them together. By the way, I took philosophy when I went to, went to college. I took philosophy because they said there would be no math. They lied because there's, cause there's math and logic, and I don't know, which actually helped me out with my algebra. But anyway, uh, but he was eloquent. He was knowledgeable in Old Testament scriptures. In fact, some people believe they wrote Hebrews. So I'm not going to get into that. Uh, Paul obviously planted uh, the church and built some loyalty during that 18 months and had a passion and devotion for spreading the gospel. And of course, giving loyalty to Jesus because he was judged to be the best leader as determined by the eyes, the human eyes would be wrong. Religious loyalty must be given to Jesus because he's the only choice. He's the only choice. Not because he's the best of the best. We're not picking between, and, and, and this was Paul's major point, we're not picking between Peter and Cephas and Apollos and, and Christ. We're not picking. Christ is the only choice. He's the only one that, can, that we should pick. He's in, he, the, it's Christ's church. It's his church. So, Paul then asks a series of rhetorical questions to demonstrate the foolishness 
or lining up behind any sectarian leadership in, in the church. I wish some folks would do that today. Is Christ, is Christ divided? What's the answer? No. Was Paul crucified? No. Were you baptized in, in Paul's name? No. Resounding no's, right? And notice that he inserts his own name into, the, into this ridiculous question just to make sure they understand. Yes, sir. Right, 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 all the above. Was John Calvin divided? Is, was, is John Calvin divided? Is, is, was, was John Calvin crucified? Was Alexander Campbell crucified? All the above. Just a ridiculous. Yeah. So, is Christ divided? Can he tolerate our devotion to human leaders? whoever they may be. What does it say about our love and devotion to him if we elevate and worship <clears throat> uh, a human person? Now, I, I, I'm going to step away for a second. I'm going to step over here for a minute. Oh, no, no, I'm just going to metaphorically step over there anyway. Is it okay for us to have preachers that we like? Yes. I like Paul. I'm a big fan. I'm a, yeah, well, I'm a big fan, you know. But, <laughs> big fan. I'm a big fan of Paul's. Okay? I, I, th I really think that, I think re we really have a, a gym that, you know, when he, he's one of those guys that when he goes to other congregations, you know, they're like, man, I hope they know how good they got it back in his hometown, you know. I mean, I really do feel that way, okay? I'm a big fan of Paul's. Uh, you're turning red. Don't turn red, okay? I, I'm a, I'm unabashedly big fan, okay? It's okay to have preachers we like. It's okay to have, have fellows we like. I like it when Dana gets up and preach. I like Dana. I like Dana, okay? It's okay to do that, all right? But... At the point that I elevate them above everybody else, or that I put them on the level with Christ, that's where my problem is. Or that I just absolutely 100% believe everything that comes dripping out of his mouth. Wait a minute. One of the reasons I like Paul is because he follows God's word. One of the reasons I'm a big fan of his is because he teaches God's word. That's why I'm a big fan of his. Not because, not because you know, he is a great orator, but not because he's a great orator. Not because of his intense logic. He has great logic, don't get me wrong. But one of the reasons I'm a big fan is because he follows God's word. So was Paul crucified. Only Christ's death could offer freedom from sin and death, Hebrews 9, 12. So if an apostle's death could not suffice, then how much more would the sacrifices of human leaders benefit anyone? Paul's making the point here that, look, there's only one that can save sins. There's only one that was crucified for you. There's only one way to get your sins washed away, and that's through the blood of Christ. Can't go any other way. Were you baptized in Paul's name? Their baptism had been in Christ's name because only he has the authority to forgive sins in response to the act of baptism. So you can elevate these other fellows, but they're, they're not going to do you any good. They're not going to lift you up. So it, it, even an apostle could not for, forgive sins. So how much more, how much less the uninspired leaders of today? That, that people follow around. The people put their, their literal faith in. There was a fellow in California who had a huge following. So millions and millions and millions of books. Made millions of dollars. Robert Schuller had millions of people 
listening to them on TV, all right? And once he died, it was over. Those people that followed him, there was nothing there. And they all withered away. It was gone. It was a cult of personality. And there, there are millions of people that put their faith and trust and belief in Robert Schuller instead of putting their faith and trust and belief in God and in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, don't do that. He said, I thank God that none of you have, except Crispus and Gaius, that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say you were baptized in my name. Now, in this section here, 14 through 17, a lot of people try to make the claim that, that baptism is not essential and important because of what Paul says here. But if you just read it, it makes, if you just read what he says, it, it makes understanding. Paul makes a distinction here in what he was talking about. The problem was caused by their pride. He had actually baptized a few, but who you were baptized is of minute importance than who you were baptized into. Well, I got baptized by Brother Roger P. Johnson, famed gospel preacher. So what? So what? Well, you, was, was Roger P. Johnson divided for you? I don't know anybody who's named Roger P. Johnson, by the way. I don't know. All right. But you were baptized by so-and-so. Did that make the baptism that much better? Did he put you down in such a perfect way? That's not the point. The point was who were you baptized into? You're baptized into Christ. And that's what Paul's making here. The importance of baptism to salvation is fully recognized by Paul. He was baptized to wash away his own sin, Acts 22, 16. And he taught everywhere the necessity for everyone else, Galatians 3, 27, Romans 6, 4. So even in Corinth, he insisted that baptism was essential to membership of the one body, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, when we get to it, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or slaves, great, slaves are free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. My point, being of all that, is that Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't diminishing baptism here. He was just simply saying that, that your mindset behind it, your mindset behind it isn't about who did the thing, but what you were baptized into. Am I following this person or am I following Christ? Have I dedicated my life to that person and what he says? Or have I dedicated my life to Christ and what Christ says? Verse 16. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I, I didn't know whether I baptized anyone. It was Paul's custom to entrust the physical act of baptizing converts to a, an assistant, such as John, Mark, Silas, or Timothy. And there were occasions, however, when he found it necessary to do the actual baptizing with his own hands, as is cited here. He, in this passage, viewed it as, as providential that he had baptized so few of them, denying them to make an excuse of connecting his name with the party. In fact, the, the tendency in Corinth was to make too much of the human involvement in the process of salvation. He wanted no one to think that he was more important than God's plan, that he was just being a messenger of that plan. And he certainly wanted no man to single him out for loyalty because Paul had baptized him. By the way, who, how many people did Jesus baptize? Amen? Besides Paul? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Matter of fact, if you look at John 4, 1, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. Right? Not because baptism wasn't important, but because, the, because of, of the problems that would have came from that. All right. So what was the natural result, result of preaching the gospel? What's the natural result of people, the preaching of the gospel right now? Folks are baptized. The natural result, the natural result of people uh, uh, preaching the gospel, 
listening to God's word is that folks are baptized. Paul was emphasizing that his mission was to spread the gospel. He wasn't putting the cart before the horse. All right? The gospel comes first. Then people are baptized as a result of that. Does everybody respond to the gospel the same way? No. Some people reject it. Some people reject God's word. Right? Our job is, our job is to throw the seed out. What's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to throw the seed out. Is that our responsibility? Yes, no, yeah, okay. Everybody shake their head. All right. Our responsibility is to throw the seed, right? Some of it lands on good ground. Some of it lands on fertile ground. Some of it lands on the roadway. So he said, he said, I came to you not with words of wisdom, but the cross of Christ be empty of its power. Wisdom. He, he wasn't sliding Apollos or any other, but he was not interested in the wisdom of men. Now, not using the Greek rhetoric philosophy style of the day, a, a sophist, a wise man, came to denote the, that word, came to denote a person with a nimble tongue and a nimble brain. Look, I'm not trying to, to fool you with my logical tactics here. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to paint this, this picture. All right? If you, listen, if you listen to some of those religious channels every now and then, man, who wouldn't want, who wouldn't want to be a follower? You get your car, you get, you get a house, if you're, if you're really good, you know, you get the love of your life. All things are wonderful and great, and there's no problems at all. What's the problem with that? Let's do that. But that's not reality. That's not reality. And, 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 and Paul's saying here, look, I didn't come at you with, with all this Greek rhetoric and the philosophy, the philosophy of the day, what I came to you with God's word and his power. And the reason was, lest his cross be, lest be, cross be emptied of its power. The main thing is the main thing. What is important is the cross of Christ. What is important for Paul is the cross of Christ. And it's imperative that we keep the cross, whether it's death, burial, and resurrection, central to not our, only our theology, but also our worship and service to the Lord. It's the cross that brings us together. When we gather around the Lord's table, that brings us together. We are in communion, right? We are in communion, not only with each other, but we are in communion with Christ. And in a sense, we are in communion with all those around the world that are that are worshiping God the same, in the same way. That's what brings us together. It's not the songs. It's not the preachers. That's part of it. That, that, that's, that's the way we worship. But we're brought together by the cross of Christ. Without him dying on the cross, that death, burial, and resurrection, without that, there's nothing else. That's the central thing. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at it, Genesis, Malachi, through Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all point to the cross. Acts and Revelation, all point back to the cross. That's the centerpiece. And Paul says here that that's what he came to preach. That's what he came to preach. So get off of this human wisdom stuff and, and, and quit lifting up humans and lift up Christ and his crucifixion. And that's what Paul came to do. Next week, when we talk about the wisdom of men, I'm going to show you an illustration that talks about the wisdom of men as compared to the, what, what Paul terms as the foolishness of God. Any questions or thoughts before we end for today? All right. We'll pick up next week at verse 18. May God continue to bless you in your studies.